Hey guys, it's Sam here. I'm back in zone for another training session. Now I'm back in the gym training. And today's gonna to be a shoulder stay, just shoulders isolation stay, as I'm working out my split, having returned to this and going steady on the biceps. Did the chest workout yesterday, which used triceps quite a lot. So I don't really want the pushing here and I can avoid that and leave the triceps alone as well if I just do some isolations for my deltoids. So that's what we're gonna whip through here today. Loads of my friends are here, so it's been fun already. And uh, then after that, maybe a meal first time and enjoy the rest of the weekend. So I'm getting started with the Watson side lateral rows machine, which I found my favorite, although I do prefer the one with the weight stack than the plate loaded one, this feels a little bit different. But either or, one of my favorite pieces for side belts, and that's what I'm concentrating on with the isolation moves, concentrating on side belts, then rear, then maybe front, but usually skip it because of all the incline work that I would do on a chest day. So I'll get started set one now. While I'm getting back into things, so I'm doing everything kind of higher reps than I'd normally do, and that's going to be the thing for the next week or so. And move on from there. The second set give you a clear review of how this thing works. Ended up finding it a really busy time, which uh, has its pros and cons. I've ended up bumping into all sorts of people I haven't seen for a while. And this being my local, I know pretty much everyone here. But uh, on the downside, I'm just having to be a little bit careful. I'm not getting in anyone's way with the filming. It's not going to be the longest session today, just doing belts and pressing. And I'll just rattle through it with set three here. different doing this kind of thing to using dumbbells but definitely a place for both and I particularly love the dumbbells for running down the rack on a drop set and also changing the angle with the hand as I've been exploring where people believe that turning the hands like this and raising it out to the side repeats more of the side deltoid that's something that I started playing around with and I'm gonna stick with for a while if it doesn't work it doesn't show a noticeable difference doesn't really matter too much to me because it'll give me more variety and keep things interesting after all this time. I was just doing a few pointers there on the straight arm pull downs for back. Find that if you really lean forwards on that one and make sure you've got the tension on the muscles by having it fully extended and the, and the, the weights you know, off the stack, fully holding on to them, arms straight, you get more contraction with the long rope. As you pull the elbows back, you get that more in the muscles in your back. Still feel the tension on your triceps, but uh, that's how I like to do the straight arm pull downs. So I was just giving a bit of assistance there that's totally not relevant to a shoulders workout. So I'll keep it moving, get the last set done on here, and then think of something else. Right, last one, here we go. Oh. 
next isolation I'm going to look at is for the rear dots. So I'm now on the machine that I was on last night with chest, but it's set up the other way so it gets to the rear delts like this instead of having the arms back here and sat in the chair the other way for a, a chest fly. Very useful bit of kit for the shoulders and chest isolations and I've got it all positioned right. I like my hands on these handles as opposed to the vertical handle when doing the rear delts. comes off stripped down to the vest I tell you that's lightweight that's only 30 kilos on there did that for like 18 reps or whatever obviously it'd be a bit more weight if I was doing lower reps but this is the theme for this week a bit higher reps a bit more fun. I'll jump in for set two now finding that I can feel that mostly in my rear delts a lot better if I focus on keeping my back wide and just letting the joint of the shoulder move rather than allowing the the back muscles and muscles in the upper back to participate if I'm clinching my shoulder blades closer together just deliberately do the opposite of that by keeping the back wide and just moving the shoulder. That's uh, how I feel like I'm getting the most, most of the feeling in the right place in this particular exercise still. Uh, number three. So this is going to be mainly a case of what's free now. Like, like yesterday, the, the wanting a meal has now kicked in. So I, uh, I came in here on pretty empty. Spent a bit of time helping people out and then got started filming and I'm behind on food already. I'm just thinking about food and stuff. Now I'm wanting to do that side dumbbell lateral so you turn the hands in. I was explaining before, but Wanting it leaning against the bench is just pushing the bench further and further forward. So I'm going to do it freestanding as a change from the last time I did it. But when the, it's really nice when you go to a gym and the, the incline benches have a fixed into the floor. 
but then you can do exercises like this and really lean on it without worrying about scooting it forwards but that's not the option for today I just have to, <laughs> have to keep myself stable and once again I'm going to try this really really light and focus on the feeling with it like I did last time and especially as I've got to stabilise it myself I'm only going to go for you can see 25 pound dumbbells there and probably only work with these for this exercise because unlike the last time I did this variation it's now my third exercise it was only my second thing and I when I tried it before so look, hands turned in here It's a, a variation that's very similar to what I was describing before of seeing all the old timers talk about with the side lateral raises and twisting it just at the end as if you're pouring water out of the handle. It's a bit like having that sort of angle all the way up. I'm just so hungry now though. I feel like that buffet last night has just stretched my insides and I'm now expecting more and more like that permanently, which wouldn't be a bad thing given the bulking journey that I'm on. I'm very, very close to 300 pounds, guys. I got weighed this morning, like properly, gone to the loop, loads of weight like, properly in this morning at 298. So we're getting much, much closer. It really won't be long. Anyway, stop talking about breathing all the rest of get on my set two here. side belts if nothing else. Okay, here we go again. I might as well move. Okay, here we go. I mean, I would put them in their designated place for what weight they are, but now everything's jumbled up. They're next to each other, that'll have to be good enough, but <laughs> I'm not reorganising the whole gym, just because everyone put them back in the wrong place already. Getting busier, that's going to be sufficient for today. It's everything I had in mind for those isolations, really, on the priority areas for the delts, won't be needing the front raises. Obviously it started with the incline on, on chest yesterday and uh, if the bicep's up to it, I could be training back tomorrow, I'll have to see, but right now, as you probably realise, the priority is food, so I'm going to see if there's space in the cafe, the batteries here are going to last, and we can wrap it up over there. While I'm getting ready to get a move on, I was just thinking what would be a nice topic to tackle once I'm sat down again. I've had a couple of questions come in privately about setting up the diet after some of the recent videos. So I think what would be quite useful is to take a couple of those as practical examples of 
what you do to check that it's right and what you might adjust and where you go from there. So I've got one or two of those to go through. I'll be able to tolerate talking about such things when I've got food in front of me as well and that's the plan now. So I'm back with this and sorted out food earlier. There's nothing special by the way. It was a box of chicken and rice, can you believe it? And uh, now that I'm back here in front of the computer, I thought it'd be good for this episode to take a couple of practical examples with the numbers and the kind of concepts that I've been explaining about diet in the last few days and tackle a couple of questions that are basically around that with some of your numbers that were sent in. So a couple of a couple of questions that weren't in the comments that come to me privately that would make more sense to explain in depth. I can take here. So I've got, I've got one saying, followed on YouTube. Um, nice to see you interact there. Thank you. I uh, want to figure out how many macros I should be taking. Currently, I'm estimated around 170 grams of protein a day, 414 carbs and 3,426 calories. I'm currently 175 pounds, that'll be the body weight, and trying to bulk up to hopefully 185, 190, so gain, you know, 10 to 15 pounds of body weight, basically, like nearly a stone, you know, 14 pounds is a stone. Are these numbers cracked or needs tweaking? and love the content. Okay, yeah, thanks for the positive message. I'll happily take your question on camera here. So if you look back to the examples and, and explanations I've given, you, ha you haven't given the full data here that this would be based on because while I don't believe in using calorie deficits and the energy balance and having to account for it all and body closed system and that whole paradigm, what I do with bulking is make sure that theoretically you're at least in a calorie surplus because I do believe in energy in the main and I do believe that energy is required to build muscle on top of run the body. So what I was suggesting is taking a basal metabolic rate, then your activity level, which is sometimes called the activity multiplier, or you could find by putting calculate um, maintenance calories, you could Google that, calculate maintenance calories, and then whatever you come up with after those two steps, putting another 200 or 300 calories onto the daily diet, and then breaking down the allowance from there, but not just as a, a macro plan. I don't do flexible dieting, I do meal plans, so I'd want to set the foods and eat the same foods because, okay, sometimes in like the nutrition world and conferences and books nowadays about nutrition, they call all of this boiling it down to calories and macros as nutritionism. They call it the nutritionism like of, of food and want to get away from that. And that's how I feel about it. I don't feel that 170 grams of protein is the same across all proteins. I've talked before about complete proteins where we mean protein food that contains all of or close to all of or a good spectrum of what we call the essential amino acids so the nine that your body can't produce on its own having to come from from outside and broadly speaking that is basically the animal food so i'd say 170 grams of animal meat or produce um, well 170 grams of protein fr sourced from animal foods animal meat animal produce like milk and eggs or otherwise you're going to have to jig it with uh, different combinations of plant foods that would give you, in aggregate, the complete spectrum of essential amino acids. And I covered that in its own separate video, so you may want to look at plant-based diet and complete proteins, um, separate video that I've done if you're, if you're not happy to eat basically. All this, all this animal food, which it's going to be for the for the good protein. Then, when it comes to the carbohydrates, I tend to talk about starches because they're bound up glucose, and it's glucose that we want more than other random carbohydrates like cellulose, which your body can't um, even digest. That's also known as fibre, but it is actually a carbohydrate called cellulose. Galactose, lactose, which people don't always digest so well. That's actually a carbohydrate as well, and then fructose which is metabolized through the liver is not great in huge quantities and kind of 
uh, sucrose, which is a combination of glucose and fructose. You know, so the so the, the carbohydrates, not not all grams of carbohydrates are created equal either. So I tend to say that in the carbohydrates in the bodybuilding and what's useful and what can be more useful, it tends to be glucose. So we're talking about starches, which in the main is rice and potato, other some other root vegetables and bread or brown rice. That kind of thing. And then obviously with the fats, you haven't mentioned the grams of fats, but it's going to be whatever um, whatever your protein and your carbs here are times four, however many calories less it is from that. Um, divide, you know, divided by nine, because it's nine calories like per gram. So, you know, I would say that for a female, it should be a minimum of 40 grams a day of fat for a male, possibly. 60 is a minimum, but I, I could do this count while well, we've got these numbers in front of us. If we had the 170 plus the 414 that you mentioned, that would be 584 grams of protein and carbohydrate con combined. That times four is 2,336. So, uh, 2,336, three, three. Two, three, three, I said, 34. Two six minus two three three six. It's just, so you'd have one thousand and ninety. Um, one thousand and ninety. So one zero nine zero calories left up to that limit, which would be coming from fat. That divided by nine, you'd be looking at one hundred and twenty. So I just you know backwards work that out for you that you'd have one hundred and twenty one. We'll call it one hundred and twenty grams of excuse me, grams of fat, like for this. But because you haven't mentioned meal plans or foods or anything, I'm going to assume that you're doing like a flexible dieting thing and you're just trying to hit these numbers for a day. And when you're doing it that way, things are less in your control because, as, as I was saying, they're not all created equal. All, all, pro all protein grams, all carbohydrate grams, and all fat grams. So what I would do... And I can't do this for you in this video because I don't have your age and your height. So I can't wind it all the way back to the basal metabolic rate. But, you know, the most thorough thing of what you could do of checking this in terms of the numbers and, and start, you know, starting over would be to go back with your age, height and weight at hand and put BMR calculator into your computer and get that all worked out. Then take that number and go activity multiplier and you know be guided by how active your lifestyle is and how often you're going to be training a week and get that number then add two or three hundred to it and then that's going to be the equivalent number to the 3426 calories you put here then you're going to have the protein allowance which is you know you've put done you've done a gram of protein per pound of body weight which is what the research would suggest is well the research actually suggests 0.7 ish like grams per pound of body weight but we round it up to not get it wrong and and um you know this is suitable if you're not like extra super duper enhanced and all that kind of thing if you are then yeah hey i don't really want to know about it but <laughs> but i would suggest that you could have more more protein there i always tend to remind on that point otherwise you, you know you're not making the most of the risks that you're taking if you're not taking up as much protein as you might be able to deal deal with in in a enhanced system um so yeah you've got the protein about right but I would basically, you know, take that 170 grams, whatever the whatever the carbs and, and fats are going to be to make up whatever the new calorie numbers are and actually plan them like into a diet and use and use animal meats for making up the 170 grams of protein. Use starch carbs for making up the whatever the new carb number is going to be and have the fats either from the from the animal food that you're doing anyway, so the fattier meats and fish like your salmon. Uh, mackerel and and the fats that are the greater proportion of calories in animal foods like eggs actually a whole egg more of the calorie value is coming from the fat in the yolk than the protein that's in the yolk and the whites combined so that that's how you bring up the fats there construct it and basically put the carbohydrates you know closer to before workout and after workout and the the meals that are going to be just fat and protein earlier on in the day and later on in the day, however many meals it's going to break down to sensibly when you play with the different foods and the numbers you've got in front of you. And maybe it's going to be maybe it's going to be four or five meals. Maybe it's going to be three or four if they're bigger meals. 
baseline it as actual meals, and then do all the measurements that I would recommend a week later, so your body weight, tape measure stuff, caliper stuff, and then you'll know, <laughs> you'll know whether it's enough to, to be gaining, because you'll see whether you've gained or not, and if nothing happens, you probably need to add more. <laughs> and it's as simple as that, really, it's just kind of a little bit involved and a, a little bit laborious and time consuming if you haven't done this before and sometimes people want to like just hand over the whole job to someone else to plan it in the first place set it up which they can do quicker and then and then refine it week week by week depending on the results that come in but I've just explained how you could do it all for yourself now that's the going back to square one and like restarting this whole thing you could actually do it without doing that you should know like whether whether this in, is enough to be to be gaining or not because the simple question is are you gaining or not you know take the 3426 that you've got i don't know for sure whether you're, you're just flexible macro macro shooting or whether you've got a meal plan but let's let's do it as a meal plan for the numbers you've got say baseline it be consistent to it for a week and then measure and then you're only going to have to do what you'd have have to do anyway with the with the more thorough drilling into the numbers and BMR and activity and extra and what I've just described. You do the same thing here as you make a meal plan out of the numbers you've already got, and you'll get your answer when you when you come back in a week and see if you've gained you know half a pound, a pound, two pounds, a um, little bit on the skin folds perhaps. So what what we're looking for is is more in the body weight and more you know, quarter of an inch here and there in the tape measure bits, but not loads on the skin folds around around the the sights on the abs and and um the back of your triceps and stuff like that. Otherwise what you're doing is adding more body fat than lean mass what you want and then you'd have to rejig again and perhaps you put protein higher and carbs lower in in the same calories and rebaseline it and go again. So You'll know, like if you if you're being consistent and you're going to do it every day to either the numbers you've got or working it out again. Once you are consistent, you actually measure. You should know, and you know the most basic way of doing that is with the body weight. But to really do it properly and and have more of a steer on what adjustments to make afterwards, you shouldn't be just doing it with body weight because, as I like to say, this isn't Weight Watchers. We're not just trying to take your scale weight up and down. We're trying to change your body. So. Having eyes on with what's happening with that, with photos, video, tape measure, skin folds is the way forwards, you know, it's the way to really do this properly. And if you're just going by the look in the mirror or photos, as sometimes people get in a kind of coaching setup, things happen too slowly to tell. <laughs> so things happen more quickly and little changes in the tape measure and the calipers. So you need to like look at that because if we're doing this week by week, you can't expect to look a whole look di whole lot different in photos, except in extreme cases where you're either very new or you're at the very end of a contest prep where it's extreme fat loss and you look more and more defined by the day. Outside of those scenarios, you're not going to look a whole lot different. Like in photos, if you've done them properly, stood under the same lighting in the same conditions, uh, in the same way week by week, you, you're just not. So, so this is how to track it. This is how to know. So you should. You should rebaseline this as a as a meal plan and uh, and do it that consistent way where where you can have more of a grip on it than just shooting for the for the macros and as for the calories and macros you've got you can either do that process on the ones you've got or as I say go back to the very beginning and and do it with your BMR which I can't do as I say I can't do here and now because I haven't got your height and age so I can't work out your your basal metabolic rate because that's what that's what the whole calorie theory is based on like that's the whole that's the whole starting point for figuring out these theoretical like calorie surpluses and calorie deficits and what have you so i hope that makes sense that's how you do it it's it's very boring you know people don't do this but it's the main reason why people are spinning their wheels in the gym and that, that goes for like enhanced people as well as as well as uh, people own natural if you're uh, if you're not doing doing this or something similar to this or if you haven't done this so much in the past that you've now got an acuity for it 
Um, pro probably all this stuff is th actually the reason why you're not not moving forward. So that, go that goes for everyone. That's what we spend most of the time drilling into when we're tr really trying to make progress because um, it's neglected because it's it's kind of dry and it's numbers and stuff. But it really shouldn't take that long. And the, the time that you spend doing this kind of thing is very well invested. You know, <laughs> by the time you've worked out and chatted to your friends and travelled back and forth. The whole thing might have taken you two hours, but two hours spent on this stuff, you could really, really have yourself set up and prepared to make more progress in the next six months than you made in even the last six years. In some cases, it's not it's not unusual because this is how you know and figure out baseline track and adjust to deal with what's actually happening and keep things moving forward. And... Uh, that was quite a lot of rambling for answering that question, so I'll move on to the next one. The next one that I've got um, privately that was quite interesting is worth commenting on more at length. It, it is uh, to do with competing. This is actually a question that came up, or a similar question came up um, ages and ages ago, and I put in one of my separate Q&A videos before I was doing every workout as a video, so, you know, three months ago. But I can treat it again in more detail, basically... Um, this this viewer of the channel has said, I'm interested in competing sometimes. Could you talk about when to know it's right to compete and things you recommend to do in a first, a first prep? Thanks. It's quite a broad question. I mean, things to do in a first prep or any prep is a very long process and uh, relating it to the other question, the main thing you're going to do is this kind of tracking because you're going to have to make sure that you're on track for a deadline and you're going to be doing a cutting down and kind of finishing off program i tell you i tell you very much like my way of working whether it's me or working with someone else the, the way i do like in any prep is basically have the tracking going on and it's mostly dietary manipulations that are going to take me towards like a goal that's going to be shredded enough to step on stage with the muscle that i've got at that point from the previous off season, the previous show, and any time in between, what I'm shooting for really is like about four millimeters maximum on the skin fold caliper measures. So when I start the prep, I'll have the measures for that week. I'll measure them week and weekly, and I'll be seeing what rate they're kind of coming down towards the deadline. I want to be almost ready at about two weeks out. Then with the final two weeks, <laughs> I'll do like a, a mock depletion and load. So people talk about like the peak for a bodybuilding contest and carb loading. Basically, it's making the muscles look as big as they can with the muscle that you've got. And that's to do with the storage of glycogen and water in them. And they call this carb loading because what you need to eat carbs, glucose, to have glycogen to fill them up but probably you've been eating less of that in the diet that's brought you down to low body fat so putting that back in again should fill up the muscles that are left and uh, with the fat loss you've done with all the weeks before they're best revealed and that's the the magic combination unless you overdo it and the water that they hold ends up kind of getting into the subcutaneous um, body fat that is left, that little bit that's left and in the skin, and they call that spilling over. And that's when you're going to look more full than you did a few days ago from eating more carbs again, but less, excuse me, less defined and less definition and not make, showing yourself at your best. So what I do to get the best of it is get all the fat loss done, approximately by two weeks before the show and then with the week before before the final week I'll do like a mock peak you know a mock carb load and your body will hoard more of it in the muscles if you deplete like more you know they call it carb depletion and load if you eat even less it primes them to uptake like even more it's a bit a little bit, little bit like pulling an elastic band back so that the, you know the more you stretch it one way the more it wants to snap in the other way so the more you Pulling the glycogen out, the more it wants to hoard it back in. So you prime it for that for a few days. So, you know, on that mock peak week, on that two weeks out bit, I might take three days of zero carb and then calculate how much how much um, the body weight and muscle and lean mass that you've got should be able to store and try and put it in in two days and see what I'd look like a day or two after that. And that's going to be the run that I'd do for the final week. But now we're testing it. 
So I basically do that and uh, see what they looks like and get a feel for what time of day and what, what day after the depletion and load. It might be the very next day after the second day of the load. I normally do like four, you know, say four. I normally, I normally try not to overload it. I'd rather, I feel like it looks better to look a little bit flat, but condition be there than, than to have spilt over and ruined it. And, it, you know, you end up having to do other things that are not great to try and pull it back if you completely spill it over. So I normally do more, more days of depleting it than loading it. So it might be four days of depleting it, two days of loading it, see what I look like on day seven it would be and day eight and that'll give me a feel for whether I'm going to do you know more depletion or less depletion more load less load and that's what I do with the very last week like leading into the show and that's kind of kind of the whole whole prep and that that's that's what I do in a prep on top of like the tracking that I'm doing anyway like in a cutting thing and wanting to see skin folds go down obviously the other things that you've got to do are practice the poses a lot for the category that you're doing and get familiar with the expectations and judging criteria of the category and the contest that you're entering and practice all of that stuff like to its maximum from you know eight to ten weeks out and <laughs> just like hope for the best so like I've I've won a couple of contests I've had almost all the others that I've done have been top five yeah in the class, you know, I've been in a class of, of like 12, 15, and then some classes where, where it's only like four or five of you anyway. It really varies. You never know what it's going to be like until you see who shows up on the day. But, you know, all the contests I've done, I've either, I've either you know, been, been top top three, top five, won it, or, you know, featured highly. Um, so it's something that I'm well practiced in. But in terms of the other part of your question is when do you know it's right to compete? It depends how big you are. You know, it depends like what level of contest you're coming in at. Like the look at the previous pictures and the previous winners of the kind of contests that you're looking at going into, and and um, you know, get someone experienced to look at that and d decide. You know, objectively how big they are because you might be uh, you might be thirty five pounds to fifty pounds like heavy heavier than that in body weight at the start of the prep to come down to whatever that target is so you know you you, you want to be okay, if there's contests that you're aiming to win like you're looking at you're looking at people that that won it last time round that are you know between thirty five and fifty pounds lighter than you in their stage condition if you can work that out. And if you're not that much heavier um, than what that's going to be, then you're not big enough, and you need you need to wait until you are. And maybe that'll be later on in the year or the next year season round. <laughs> so, so you know these things take time. But a good guide would be if you looked at a good guide. Um, I mean, if if it's the the world of like natural bodybuilding contests, apart from the people that cheat all the time, they're going to be a lot lighter. So, so that you'll just have to get someone with an experienced eye to look at the photos if you're entering something like that. If it's more of a you know, <laughs> anything goes competition, then you want to a good guide would be to look at the MPC weight limits for men's physique and classic physique for your height. And um, I basically say that if in your most bulked up form you're not at least forty pounds heavier than that, um, then that limit for your, for your height you're not big enough yet, and uh, and just kind of wait out until you are, you know, do a, do a bulking plan and everything that entails for a few more months or maybe a year to the next time round, and then look at it again, and then you'll know it's right, and and find someone who can. Give you give you good advice specific to the to the contest and the timelines that you're looking at. So, hope you find that interesting. I think that, um, that gives a more you know practical example and a, a different topic to round out today's video. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm doing a video every day, so if you find all this interesting, make sure you subscribe. Or if you're trying to help me out in return, just share my stuff and. Uh, put it on your social media and that all helps me help more of you and I'm back at it every day so talk to you tomorrow. Cheers.